So, why don't you go ahead and uh, introduce yourself and your role here at George Washington. I'm uh, Sean Murphy, Professor of International Law at George Washington University. I've been here about six years. Okay, and so, uh, why don't you go ahead and, and, and kind of describe to me the consensus within the international legal community uh, when they look at the justifications at the, for that the U.S. was making and, and what they think of that. Well, like any community, I don't think the academic community is monolithic in its view about the legality of invading Iraq, but I would say that the vast majority of scholars in the field of international law would say that the justification asserted by the United States and its allies for uh, invading Iraq is not regarded as being uh, adequate under international law. There is a minority group of academics who believe that the intervention invasion is permissible under international law, but I would say that it's a small minority. And I would further say that it's mostly based in the United States and is not found uh, so much abroad. And so when you look at uh, the role of the media during this time period, uh, could they have reported on this fact before the actual military intervention? Well, I think that there was some reporting that took place about uh, what the views of the academic community were, um, but they tended to be expressed in terms of, well, there's this side to the position and there's that side to the position, um, without really establishing that there is a large number of people on this side and a smaller, much smaller number on the other side. So you would see the same two or three or four people who are identifying with the position being advanced by the United States expressing their views um, over and over again, uh, even though they really weren't representative of the academic community at, 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 in, at, at large. And when you're, talk a little bit about when you look at this uh, legal justification, if you could kind of characterize it and why it doesn't really make sense. Well, just at the face value, when you sit back and ask the question, is it possible that you can have a resolution adopted back in 1990 to deal with a particular conflict where one state had invaded another? Can you really take that and just easily use it to justify an invasion of a country 13 years later? It's a bit of a stretch right at the start unless you can make certain fairly obvious connections. And the problem is you can't make those obvious connections. The authorization to use force back in 1990 was pretty clearly focused on Iraq's invasion of Kuwait, on the need for Iraq to get out, for it to do certain steps in order to reestablish the existing situation at that time. And it authorized states to use force when Iraq was failing to do that. Well, they used that force in 1991, as is well known. Iraq was kicked out of Kuwait. Iraq agreed to a number of uh, requirements that were imposed on it by the Security Council. And that was the end of the conflict. Uh, the problem then becomes, well, in 2003, when you try to reach back and use that legal authorization, how exactly is it you can do that? The theory advanced by the Bush administration was that there was sort of a, uh, a, a loaded gun lying there that could be picked up at any time based on a single state's interpretation or a few states' interpretation that Iraq was in noncompliance with uh, provisions of UN Security Council resolutions. Well, that theory just doesn't hold together. The, the entire regime in which these resolutions were adopted was a multilateral one. It was a one where there were many members of the Security Council who were deeply concerned that the authorization to use force be fairly narrow, be targeted, not be used easily out of context. And when you track through the different resolutions starting in 1990 and on up to the present, including the, the one resolution that was adopted in the context of uh, the actual invasion of Iraq in 2003, it just doesn't hold together to say that that authorization continued to be available for any state to pick up and use uh, whenever it thought it necessary to do so. Now, th there were a couple of incidences where the United States 
did attack Iraq uh, under different, you know, 1993, 1998. Can you speak to uh, were they trying to set a precedent and what makes it not a precedent and not a mandate? Well, there were very low levels uses of force against Iraq right from the start of the, the end of the hostilities. There were creation of no-fly zones in northern uh, and then southern Iraq uh, in order to help protect uh, Iraqi Shia and Iraqi Kurds. And there was relative acceptance of that within the international community. There was some dissent, but there was relative acceptance of it. There were also other strikes, uh, air strikes in 1993 and later on in the decade as well where the United States, the United Kingdom, for a certain period of time even France, was willing to see force used in a very targeted, narrow manner in order to stop Iraq from doing certain discrete things, things that were largely tied into the existing Security Council resolutions. Uh, but there was never at any time a belief that uh, these uh, low-level uses of force uh, were setting a precedent for a wholesale invasion of the country and a toppling of the Iraqi government. That certainly was not the position being expressed by any of the states at the time in undertaking these actions. It certainly was not the sense of other countries watching them do it, that they were welcoming the ability of states to use such precedents in that type of a manner. And again, when you look at the specific resolutions that were being argued about and connecting it into these particular low-level uses of force, you really can't track it on through to the arguments that were then being deployed in 2003 by the United States. And when you talk about the, uh, the part of the Bush administration's uh, legal argument is that the, the Secretary General had it basically said it was okay under Resolution 678 and 687. Can you speak to what weight does it carry for a Secretary General, Secretary General to say something like that, especially in the context when Kofi Annan was saying you can't invade Iraq, uh, it wouldn't be underneath the, the Charter in 2003? Right. On a formal level, the interpretation by the Secretary General of a Security Council resolution carries no particular weight. There's no mechanism within the UN Charter that gives the Security, the Secretary General some sort of authority to make interpretive decisions of that kind. Having said that, the reflections and the comments of the Secretary General are very important, particularly in a situation where the Secretary General perhaps has walked out of a meeting with all the Security Council members and purports to be interpreting their beliefs and their views. So you have to be careful about what it is the Secretary General is saying at what time and who's views is he expressing. But having said that, if you were to give it any kind of weight, then presumably the same level of weight should be given in 2003 to the Secretary General's fairly clear view that an invasion of Iraq was not permissible under existing Security Council resolutions. And in saying that, I think you can see that he was not just expressing his own personal view, but was expressing the view of the vast majority of the members of the Security Council, who when they met and when they talked about the possibility of invading Iraq, were quite clear in stating that they were not authorizing any state to use force to invade Iraq, at least not at that time. They left open the possibility of a future resolution, a two-step process. The United States even embarked on that two-step process when it began the possibility of circulating a resolution that would expressly authorize the invasion in March of 2003. The U.S. withdrew that resolution in the face of a very clear a loss before the, before the Security Council. So I think it's quite clear, looking at the Secretary General's statement, looking at it in context, that it's very hard to see that authorization existed. And can you speak to um, the, uh, when, when they draft up the language of a resolution and they vote on it and then each member state in a way gives their own interpretation, what weight does that uh, give to uh, what is actual there's a lot of ambiguity in the resolution. So does that, those statements give any sort of like precedent at all? Or? The standard approach in international law is to look first at the text of an instrument. This is particularly clear in the context of treaty interpretation, but even in the interpretation of Security Council resolutions, 
you can see in decisions rendered by the International Court of Justice and other fora that looking at the text is the first stop in an in interpretive process. The text is sometimes clear and sometimes it's more ambiguous. And unfortunately, in the context of the invasion of Iraq, we did have a resolution adopted in November of 2002 that was somewhat vague and did lead to some interpretations. So what does one do then? Well, the second step is to look at comments made by the drafters of the resolution at the time. And the best way of doing that is looking at the record of the Security Council when it met to adopt the resolution because all of the members will typically speak to what the resolution means and what it doesn't mean. And that is helpful then in, in understanding what does the text of the resolution uh, mean because in the case of this somewhat vague, ambiguous resolution we had in November of 2003, when you look at the comments of the members of the Security Council, it's quite clear that, again, the vast majority did not believe they were authorizing a use of force against Iraq, nor that such an authorization existed already. Indeed, what you have is member after member saying there's no aut automatic uh, authorization here. There's no uh, sort of ability to fast track this and, and simply proceed to use a use of force. Instead, we envisage a two-step process. And even the United Kingdom and the U.S. is quite clear in saying, ah, yes, we accept there's not an automatic trigger here of some kind. Uh, so you then are left with a belief uh, or an interpretation that there did seem to be a two-step process in mind. And it's only later on, after the inspectors get into Iraq, uh, and they find no weapons of mass destruction, and they're saying, you know, we need more time to do this, there's no enthusiasm at all for that second step of the two-step process. Um, and that's when the U.S. decided, well, we're just going to go off and do it on our own. Uh, but as ambiguous as the resolution might be interpreted, looked in the context of those statements by members, which I do think are important in reaching a proper interpretation, I think you can only come to a conclusion that there was no authorization at the time, there was envisaged a possible follow-on authorization, and that never occurred. It, now, the, uh, in the Butler report, you know, Jack Straw, it's, they would argue that uh, they would only meet again, and that the language was deliberately ambiguous, that they would only meet and not decide. Well, the language wasn't quite that ambiguous. When you read the three paragraphs together that are at play in this particular interpretation, it seems to be pretty clear they're talking about reports coming from two particular international organizations. The International Atomic Energy Agency, which was involved in the inspections of nuclear facilities, and the UN Weapons Inspection Group, which was involved in all the other weapons of mass destruction inspections. Those two entities, it appeared from the resolution, were supposed to provide some kind of report to the uh, Security Council. And if what they were reporting was that there had been falsehoods made by Iraq or weapons found that had not been disclosed, then that would be the basis for further action by the Security Council. That seems to me the best interpretation of what those relevant paragraphs said. The U.S. position, U.K. position, other coalition allies that went into Iraq, seems to be that any report by any state that Iraq is not in compliance with its resolutions would be sufficient for triggering uh, a use of military force. That clearly can't be right. There was just far too much concern in November of 2002 uh, by the members of the Security Council that there not be some automatic ability to use force, that the simple report by one country that there's been noncompliance would be the functional equivalent of that automatic use of force. So that can't be right. Now, could there have been some other kinds of reports from those two international organizations that could trigger it? Well, again, I don't think the Security Council was just handing over the authority to the International Atomic Energy Agency to suddenly authorize the use of force by other states. And there were different kind of reports that those organizations were giving throughout the end of 2002 and early 2003 that said certain things, but it, it was a mixed bag. They were saying things like there was no smoking gun here that we found yet in terms of weapons of mass destruction. On the other hand, we do think we're getting jerked around some by Iraq. Well, that can't be enough 
to trigger a use of force. I think the best way of interpreting this, and it was the case at that time, and it, it, it's been proven even more so in hindsight, is to say that you were looking for fairly definitive reports from these two organizations that there were major problems here. Either they had found the weapons or they were getting shut out. And then a follow-on meeting by the Security Council saying, yeah, okay, we've had enough. We've played this game long enough. It's time to go in with military force. That's what people had in mind, and that's what didn't happen. And if you look at the Butler report, you know, when they lay it out, they're taking excerpted quotes from Hans Blix saying, you know, we're not getting cooperation. But, you know, speak a little bit to, uh, it, was it written in the, in the resolution that it had to be some, some more formalized uh, reporting that they had to actually submit, you know, uh, UNSCOM had to give a document saying they're in material breach, they're not giving us cooperation, or uh, can they take excerpt quotes from the uh, Security Council meetings? The uh, resolution, unfortunately, was not particularly definitive on this. It did assert I'm sorry, that... when you say this, I'm not going to be answering. Okay. Uh, okay. The um, Security Council resolution that was adopted in November 2002 was not completely definitive on what exactly was expected from the international organizations that were involved in the weapons ex inspections. It seemed to be looking for reports that there was dishonesty on the part of Iraq or locating of weapons that hadn't been declared. Um, it did not say, well, interim reports don't count or the occasional problems, you know, don't count. We're only looking for a sort of affirmative, final, definitive, you know, we've done as much as we can do. We can't do anything more with this uh, government. There's nothing like that in the resolution. Um, but the resolution does seem to be contemplating a uh, fairly serious, fulsome reporting of some kind from these organizations that will then lead to a further Security Council consideration of whether to authorize the use of force. I think when you read the resolution closely, when you look at what the countries were saying at the time, that seems to be what they had in mind, although unfortunately it was not expressly stated as such. Okay, and um, when you look at the uh who has the authority, you know, to actually, you know, there seemed to be, a, I'm sorry, a blurring of the line of, of saying that the United States can unilaterally decide when to go to war. And, and what, uh, you know, what within the charter and what basis can you say that it's only up to the UN to decide as a whole, as all the member states? The basic scheme set up in the UN charter is that states are prohibited from using force against other states to alter their territorial integrity or their political independence. There is, however, the possibility to use force in two circumstances. One is when you're defending yourself. So if you're attacked and you get into issues of is it an imminent attack or an actual attack, but if you're attacked and you're defending yourself, it's fully accepted in the UN Charter that you can respond with necessary and proportionate self-defense. The other circumstance is when you have been authorized by the Security Council to use force against another state. In the Charter, those are the only two carve-outs to the basic prohibition. So with respect to the invasion of Iraq, the United States and its allies had to be in a position of either arguing that they were self-defending, and that's a tough argument because Iraq obviously had not attacked the U.S. or any of its allies. Um, so you would have to try to conjure up this idea of preemption, uh, trying to stop a possible deployment of a weapon of mass destruction months or years in advance, and now's the time when you have to go in. The U.S. never pushed that legal argument as much as there was discussion about it. When you look at the reporting to the Security Council, statements made by the Bush administration at the time, the positions taken by the other coalition allies, nobody was pushing the self-defense argument. The argument instead was, we've been authorized by the Security Council. And so that leads you into a discussion of what did those Security Council resolutions say that were out there? Did they provide such authorization? Was the, such authorization conditioned in any particular way? Did it cut off at a particular point? Was it limited to particular objectives? Things of that sort. And those are areas where the Bush administration and, and the other coalition allies run into real problems because 
when you look at those resolutions carefully, they just don't do what uh, the coalition said that they do. And if, if you have, um, you know, you, you mentioned in your article the difference between a, a, a ceasefire treaty agreement and uh, the difference between that and a UN Security Council resolution. Can you speak to that difference? One of the arguments that the Bush administration and other coalition allies were advancing was that you basically had Iraq materially breaching an agreement to end the, the war from 1990 to 91. That material breach allowed the use of force authorization that existed back in 1990-91 to be resurrected such that you could take it and run with it in 2003 to invade Iraq and seek out weapons of mass destruction and topple the government of Saddam Hussein. That's an interesting argument, but it falls short on a number of uh, counts. Uh, first of all, the concept of material breach is one closely associated with treaty interpretation. And there you're typically talking about a treaty between two states, or maybe a, among several states, and that one of those states has breached the treaty and therefore others can respond. Well, we don't have that with respect to the Iraq invasion. There was no treaty between, for instance, the United States and Iraq. There was a Security Council resolution passed by the Security Council that was imposed on Iraq, and there was even an acceptance by Iraq of that resolution, but there is nothing between the U.S. and Iraq. So the idea that a material breach by Iraq would trigger some ability of the United States to respond to that material breach on its own auto-interpretation really stretches that idea of material breach in treaty interpretation, stretches it well beyond what I think most scholars would, would accept. So that's one basic problem, that we're not really talking about a material breach of a normal bilateral uh, instrument. Another problem is that, as I said, Security Council resolutions simply are binding on states when adopted under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. There's not a two-way street here. Whether Iraq had accepted or rejected it doesn't matter. It's a binding instrument. And so it's not even like a treaty at all in the sense of having some level of reciprocity. So it's a bad idea to carry that kind of interpretation over to a Security Council resolution. Third major problem is that this idea of resurrecting the ability to use force is an idea that's embedded in standard armistice agreements where two sides that have been fighting reach an armistice and then they eventually reach a final peace agreement. During the time of the armistice agreement, it is traditionally accepted that one state, if the other state violates the armistice in a serious way, can resume hostilities. But once they reach the peace agreement, that's the point at which that ability to resume hostilities goes away. And even if you violated the peace agreement in some manner, unless it's some further attack on the other country, that's not a basis for resuming a use of force. Well, when you look at these particular resolutions and try to graft them onto that traditional scenario, the relevant resolution authorizing a use of force seems to have reached a point in March of 1991 where there was an armistice in place for a period of about a month, and that was under a resolution called Resolution 686. Then, in early April 1991, you get Resolution 687, which appears to be like a formal peace agreement. It was sort of the, the final big resolution where all different aspects of what Iraq had to do was agreed upon, and at that point, when you read the Security Council resolutions, it looks like a definitive end to the hostilities. Under traditional armistice final peace agreement theology, if you will, it would appear that as of the point of that mega resolution being adopted in early April 1991, you had a final peace agreement. And there was no ability, even if Iraq violated the resolution thereafter, to simply reawaken uh, an ability to use force, that that just wasn't uh, possible even under the traditional armistice approach. Final comment in that regard is that contemporary thinking about this armistice final peace agreement um, says that there's actually a big difference when the UN gets involved, that even under that 
traditional theory where you could use force in response to an armistice violation isn't still the case. When the UN has become involved and is in the process of monitoring and overseeing and participating in the conclusion of hostilities, most commentators now say once you've got the UN involved, this idea of individual states on their own interpreting that there's been a violation on the other side and therefore I can resort to the use of force has fallen away and that we have bought into a system now where these issues of peace and security are ones that if at all possible should be handled in a multilateral setting and therefore once the UN has become involved and blessed an armistice and is working with the parties, there's not even the ability to reawaken the use of force if there's a violation of the armistice agreement unless the UN has agreed that such a violation has occurred. Okay, and uh, you mentioned a little bit uh, the proportionality of, of responding to uh, even uh, breaches or uh, authorization. So if you look at the context of what 678 and 687 were saying and then Pair that to the proportionality of the U.S.'s alleged response to that. Even if you accept that there is a lawful basis under existing Security Council resolutions for a use of force to do something, you have to ask the question, well, what exactly is that something you can do? If the violation by Iraq of Resolution 687 and the provisions relating to weapons of mass destruction is the basis for saying you may now use force, then the best interpretation is you can only use that force that's necessary and proportionate to those violations. So the question would be, if Iraq in late 2002 or early 2003 is denying access to particular facilities for weapons inspectors, or if, let's say, they had found some weapons and they were refusing to destroy them, using military force necessary and proportionate to get access to those facilities, to destroy weapons that have been discovered, makes complete sense. It doesn't make sense to say, okay, there's been some breaches of Iraq's obligations regarding weapons of mass destruction, and here they are, and that, therefore, is going to trigger an ability to invade the country wholesale and topple the government. There's a great disconnect between what's being alleged to have been violated and what is the consequence of that violation. Now it is possible you could express an argument that Iraq has jerked us around so long on weapons of mass destruction that we have no confidence whatsoever that this government is going to continue to be at all helpful and the only way to achieve our overall objectives is to depose this government. Well, that's not a completely implausible argument, but I would submit that when you take it to that higher level, when you say we're not only reacting to the violations that have occurred, but we're going to go way beyond that to undertake a policy objective well beyond anything that appears within the resolutions themselves. And indeed, if you look at these resolutions, the idea that Iraq's territorial integrity and political independence is to be preserved is quite clearly stated in there. If you're going to take it to that higher level, it really needs to happen within the context of the multilateralism that led to those resolutions in the first place meaning you should be going back to the Security Council resolution, you should not be taking on that interpretation on your own. So when you, when you look at the sort of implicit uh, nature of a lot of these interpretations going on and then the, the, the vast nature of, of the actions undertaken, you know, and you know, even if, you know, there seems to be uh, no sovereign authority even within the UN to say, hey, wait, you know, this is totally illegal. You know, why didn't, you know, what are the mechanisms for the council to kind of, like, have a sanity check? Well, this is one big problem with international law and institutions, that it is not designed in a manner that can stop a major power from undertaking an action that it truly wishes to undertake. Uh, those who drafted the UN Charter were not under any delusion that by doing so they were, in fact, stopping uh, major powers from undertaking actions they feel essential to their security interests. Indeed, the existence of the ability to veto a resolution at the Security Council is a nod to the idea that permanent members, major powers, need to be able to protect their essential interests. They need to be able to veto certain resolutions, even if everybody else 
uh, thinks otherwise. Uh, so I wouldn't say it's a failing of international law and international institutions that it didn't stop the U.S. from proceeding in the manner that it did proceed. And indeed, I think when you look through the rhetoric of the Bush administration, the discourse between the Bush administration and Congress during this period, when you look at the attitudes of the U.S. population in terms of uh, polling individuals about does it matter whether we try to cooperate with other states, does it matter if we try to go back to the UN, there's a pretty clearly embedded normative system here that seems to track fairly closely with the UN Charter. That is, you shouldn't use force as a general matter. You should only use it if you're self-defending or maybe if you're authorized by some entity like the Security Council. And the U.S. paid considerable heed to that normative system throughout the process, even though eventually it did proceed without uh, any apparent Security Council authorization. Um, so it's not going to stop uh, a major power from acting when it tru truly chooses to do so. What I think is worth emphasizing, though, is that by the U.S. proceeding on this course of action without having obtained authorization, it led itself into a situation where there were significant problems, uh, problems in raising money to fund the whole thing, problems in getting other states to contribute troops, problems in getting countries like Turkey to authorize the introduction of U.S. ground forces which would have allowed an attack through the northern part of Iraq that never materialized until we got paratroopers in there which may have led to considerably greater difficulty in the south because Iraq concentrated its forces down there and therefore may have led to greater casualties on the part of U.S. and coalition uh, soldiers. And that inability to get that cooperation in many respects can be charted back to the lack of a Security Council authorization. Certainly when you look at the vote in the Turkish parliament, I think that's pretty clear. So there were costs to the United States, and there continue to be costs to the United States in not getting an authorization from the UN Security Council. Just compare the outcome in 1990-91, where authorization clearly existed, to what happened in 2003 where it did not. And the financial cost to the United States, the inability to get uh, other states to participate in the operation, the overall success of the operation, radically different in the two examples. And I think much of that can go back to these international laws and institutions. So who knows, but this may prove to be an example uh, where while international law didn't stop what happened, uh, there's now a recognition that there's big prices to pay if you don't follow the normative system, and therefore in the future maybe we'll see some greater fidelity to it. So in other words, it's only a political decision on states to follow these rules if it's, and there's not, no legal consequence, so it's only a political decision? Or? There's certainly no military force that's out there that will force states to cooperate uh, and to ad abide by UN norms on the use of force. So we don't have such a global police entity, and, and probably quite good that we don't, because who knows how that would be structured and who would be running it and, and whatnot. Um, instead, what you have is uh, diplomatic sanctions of a sort that might arise if other countries uh, are refusing to allow you to participate in certain activities or uh, to uh, be at certain conferences or uh, to obtain uh, certain benefits you might otherwise obtain. Uh, you can have economic sanctions. Obviously, those aren't deployed against the United States because we're such an economic powerhouse that it would be very difficult for other countries to do it. Um, but it can uh, lead to you know, difficulties for you in obtaining other policy objectives, whether economic or political, when you so push away the international community. So it is the case that it's more political, economic, diplomatic coercion pressures that might bring a state to heed these norms. You're much more apt to see that happen with a medium size or smaller state than some country like the United States. But those pressures are out there. In the ideal, isn't international law designed to protect the weak against the abuses of the strong? Well, I think international law is designed to create a stable and just world system. 
and uh, that may at times help smaller powers and it may at times not help smaller powers. Uh, there are times when small states have done pretty bad things and they should be held accountable to them. And it's certainly the case that Iraq under Saddam Hussein did some pretty bad things too. One of the reasons why this I think is a difficult issue for many people is that Iraq or Saddam Hussein was not exactly the poster child for the small defenseless innocent country. Um, there are a lot of reasons why people would be happy that Saddam Hussein would be ousted from, from power. Um, but having said that, the idea in the international legal system is to create a stable and just and orderly society. And so the norms that we have are designed to do that. When you push those norms away, you're more apt to see destabilization. And, you know, one has to be concerned that if you follow an interpretation where any state on its own initiative can decide that there's a just cause for resorting to war, then you may find in some future scenario if, let's say, the Security Council has demanded that India and Pakistan take certain steps to defuse a nuclear confrontation and one or the other doesn't do it, can one of those states invoke the resolution as a basis for going off and attacking the other country? Well, we don't want that. That will destabilize the world. That will make the world a worse place. And so when you think about this in the long term, we want to try to find ways of making states more likely to be faithful to this normative system. And uh, the Iraq precedent is not a good example of that. Uh, but I certainly think in the long term it's in the U.S. interest to try to push that fidelity to the normative system. And, and when you have an example of, uh, of many of the member states, uh, France, you know, having uh, gone to have military interventions without explicit approval, you know, is there, I, I think, uh, how, do you, how do you deal with a situation where everyone has dirty hands, in mm -hmm. a way, or any thoughts on, on when, when France is standing up and making these moral, principled arguments holding up international law as an ideal to follow, but then their own past is, is not ideal. Well, I think it's certainly the case that all states have bad deeds in their background in the way that most people have some bad deeds in their background. And what we are concerned with is contemporary society and how it is that states should be operating. And no matter what states have done in the past, they should be seeking to adhere to the norms that we've all agreed upon as being the proper uh, norms. Now France is an example of a country that has gone off on its own foreign frolics at times and that may make one less uh, you know, likely to say well just because you think this is a, a bad use of force why should we pay any attention to you. I guess what I would say about that is that France was certainly an articulate vocal critic of the United States but France was not the only critic. There are plenty of other countries out there that believe the United States was embarked on the wrong course of action. France had a lot of visibility because of its, uh, you know, charismatic and articulate politicians and the ability of France to wield the veto power at the Security Council. But Germany wasn't supporting this. Uh, the Soviet, uh, Russia was not supporting this. China was not supporting this. A lot of the other big countries weren't supporting it. Uh, therefore, it was very important for the U.S. to get a country like the U.K. To, to come along. A lot of the medium, smaller countries weren't supporting it at all. None of those countries are perfect in their records, either internally or externally, but they all have a right to voice their views, and we should be assessing those views based on whether or not we think they're making credible arguments with respect to the normative system we have, the institutional system we have, and let them stand or fall on their face. And we look at the uh, both the print and television news media's coverage of those debates. Did you see more of a horse race coverage, who's up, who's down, who's with us, who's against us, or did you see a, a, a substantial analysis of what the actual substance of the debates were? Well, um, I think that with respect to the media, we saw a tremendous amount of coverage, but um, there seemed to be an unwillingness to test some of the very basic elements of this normative system that was out there and asking hard questions. So, for instance, with respect to the interpretation of Security Council resolutions, there seemed to be very little effort to 
in any kind of systematic way go through what the resolutions were, what they said, what they didn't say, whether it was credible to pin an authorization to use force on them or not. There was very little coverage to that effect, I believe. When there was coverage, it did tend to be, you know, this expert says that, that expert says this, and that was the end of the matter. With, return, with regard to the attitudes of other countries, certainly that was being reported uh, in the media. Um, but again, it tended to be the U.S. is saying this, France is saying that, we don't really know who's right or wrong, and therefore, you know, we've just laid it out for you. When in fact, there were pretty compelling arguments, at least legal arguments, as to why the U.S. position was just wrong. And to give you an example, I mean, the mere fact that the U.S. was embarked on an effort to get a further Security Council resolution in February and March of 2003 and was utterly incapable of doing it because it was quite clear they not only wouldn't get the permanent members on board that they had to get on board, but they wouldn't even get nine votes at the Security Council, sort of the minimum majority necessary to at least make a colorable argument that the Security Council is behind you. Well, that was a pretty important fact that they couldn't get that, that they therefore pulled back. And then by the coalition resorting to arguments of, well, we've got the authority anyway, well, you know, that just doesn't seem very credible as a legal argument. And yet not much was made of that within the media uh, when, in fact, I think it should have been. And when you look at the Iraqi Liberation Act passed in 1998, you have this blurring of the line of Ari Fleischer and the Bush administration saying it's our official foreign policy to uh, change the regime in Iraq. Uh, you know what? But there's no painting that in the context of any sort of international law perspective of regime change. There was no effort to connect the idea of regime change under U.S. law to the international normative system, where whatever's happening in U.S. law isn't binding in any sense on the international. Uh, system. So there was that kind of a disconnect. There was also a disconnect of when we adopt a statute that says something like we want to promote regime change, that doesn't necessarily mean using force to promote regime change. And indeed, if you'd asked Congress when they adopted that statute, have you now authorized the president to use military force, the answer is going to be no. And that's precisely why you had to have a follow-on resolution uh, to, to deal with that. So, um, yes, there was a policy of regime change with respect to the Iraq, the same way we have a policy of regime change with respect to Cuba and North Korea um, and certain other countries. But that doesn't mean that there's a authorization to use force under U.S. law, and it also doesn't mean that there's some uh, ability to say, well, this has some effect on the way we should be interpreting international law because it just doesn't. And when you say the, the normative standard for regime change, what is the normative standard for, can you go into, is it even legal to have regime change? Well, under international law, you cannot use military force simply to change a government's regime. You're prohibited from using force unless you're defending yourself in some fashion. Uh, so there would be no ability to engage in regime change as sort of a policy for, for using military force. One could have written the UN Charter that way, I suppose, um, but it would be a very destabilized normative system because there's lots of countries that think another country's regime should be out of power, and if they could just say, well, that's our view and therefore we can resort to military force, then that's fine. That's not the way the Charter is written. You can defend yourself. If in defending yourself it's necessary and proportionate to oust the other government, fine, that can happen. Um, when you think about World War II, that's certainly what happened with respect to the Axis powers. Uh, but other than that, the concept of regime change in international law is mostly interested in promoting human rights standards so that one would scrutinize, monitor, regimes of other countries that were engaged in abuses internally might impose diplomatic economic sanctions on those countries to coerce it into abiding by human rights norms. Uh, but there is no basis in the UN Charter for using military force to engage in a regime change. That type of humanitarian intervention is supported by some scholars. 
and has gotten greater currency, I would say, in the past 10 years or so with the, the events that were related to Kosovo and, and other uh, matters. But it's still viewed by the majority of the academic community and, and others uh, as not being permissible under international law. And when you look at the humanitarian intervention arguments made after the war by the Bush administration, can you speak to that and what the legal arguments, you know, the absence of that sort of angle at all in the pre-war arguments? Well, I think you have to look at a legal argument for invading another country at the time that you're actually invading the other country. And it has to stand or fall at that time, I think. Otherwise, we'll get into a situation where we say, well, we're invading. We're not quite sure what the basis is going to be. We'll tell you after we get in there and figure it out. And then, oh, by the way, we got in there and we can't find a basis. And it's just not going to work that way. So you have to look at what was the basis in March of 2003 for the coalition to go in. Did they have a legal authorization to do it or didn't they? Uh, and as I've indicated, I don't think they did. Now, after the fact, is it a good thing Saddam Hussein has been ousted? Is Iraq a better place in terms of less human rights abuses and whatnot? Seems to me, yes. But again, I don't think you can say that's a basis for engaging in a use of military force either in March of 2003 or even today. There's plenty of countries worldwide where there are human rights abuses going on on a daily basis. North Korea certainly comes to mind. Other countries come to mind. If that alone is a basis for any country to say we are now going to invade that country and depose its government, I think you've introduced a very dangerous and destabilizing idea into international society because there are a lot of countries who don't like what's going on in the, the country next to them. Maybe they see human rights violations, maybe they don't, but they say they do. And if that alone is enough to authorize them to go in and use military force, I think we're in a much less safe world. And when we talk to uh, Reed Brody of, of Human Rights Watch, and he goes, and, and looks at the, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. The, uh, okay. the, um, the actual arguments that are, the, when you say regime change, some people just automatically assume that you would have to use military intervention to change the regime. What are some of the, the, the nonviolent diplomatic ways that you can uh, get a regime out through regime change? Well, it's entirely possible for either states individually or for the global community as a whole to impose non-forcible sanctions on countries that you believe we want to change the regime or at least stop the human rights abuses and whatnot. So the UN, for instance, has imposed comprehensive sanctions on countries such as Libya in the wake of terrorist acts that Libya had undertaken, uh, and other matters, and those sanctions over time seem to have been fairly effective in bringing Libya back into the fold of the international community. It has stopped, as far as we can tell, engaging in terrorist activity. It has fessed up to efforts to obtain weapons of mass destruction and even is now allowing U.S. and U.K. inspectors to come in uh, to Libya. It has paid compensation to families whose uh, uh, relatives were harmed by uh, acts of Libyan terrorism. So it's possible for economic sanctions, particularly when imposed on a global level, to coerce a state over the long term into compliant behavior. In other circumstances, it doesn't work, and Iraq may be an example of that. Iraq had comprehensive economic sanctions throughout the 1990s, it may, ironically, have successfully prevented it from getting any further weapons of mass destruction, but it did not result in Iraq doing a number of the things that the Security Council was hoping that it would do. So economic sanctions is an option. Diplomatic sanctions, where you refuse to allow a particular country to participate in international organizations or international conferences, that's entirely possible. Preventing them from engaging in sporting events might be an important uh, way of signaling displeasure. Any of those non-forceable means, you can find examples where it has had a real effect in forcing compliant behavior. In other circumstances, it has not worked so well. And could you try to indict uh, Saddam Hussein as a war criminal? And then uh, once you do that, 
create a taboo for dealing with him after that? It's possible not just to impose sanctions on states as states or on uh, governments, but also to actually go after particular individuals. You could do that either by targeting their financial assets. That's a creative sanction tool that's been used recently. recently. And the other way is to go after them criminally. So you could indict a leader such as Saddam Hussein before an international criminal court or before some sort of national court if it's got appropriate jurisdiction to do it. Um, and these sorts of things have happened. It's not always the most effective means of proceeding. Indeed, you have to think hard about whether you want to leave an out for that individual to actually flee the country and go into exile somewhere uh, in the you know, foothills of whatever country um, as a way of getting past this regime in this particular country. Once you indict them, it raises the stakes considerably. It may make it more difficult, not less difficult, to get that individual out of power. Mm. So is that one of the reasons why the United States chose to not pursue that path when Human Rights Watch came to them in the early 90s? The U.S. continued to gather information on war crimes uh, allegedly committed by Saddam Hussein throughout the 1990s in anticipation of possibly engaging in a prosecution, but it did resist actually calling for the creation of a tribunal and I do believe that was in large part because they were unsure whether this was ultimately going to be a helpful matter in getting Iraqi compliance. Okay, and when you look at um, the October 10th and 11th uh, resolutions in Congress that were passed, uh, the, the Bush administration was saying that we need this in order to uh, persuade the UN, but then once they got the UN they said we don't, we don't need any further authorization. Can you speak to, you know, the War Powers Act versus, you know, what, where does international law fall in within the U.S. legal structure? Is it factually true to say we don't need any international approval to go to this? We have our own resolution saying that we can go to war? Well, it's clear that you need some kind of authorization from Congress in order to embark on war. As a matter of U.S. constitutional law, it's clear that Congress has the power to declare war, and it's the president who then serves as commander-in-chief uh, of the army to implement uh, the, the war, the wartime operations. Um, what we had with respect to Iraq was a joint resolution by the Congress authorizing the use of force. Interestingly, it wasn't just a blanket authorization. It said, in order to defend the United States and to implement Security Council resolutions. So even within our constitutional and statutory system, we're reaching out and we're using instruments like the UN Security Council resolutions as a means for cabining the authority of the president uh, in embarking on this use of military force. So there is that connection just based on what the joint resolution itself said. If the joint resolution had said nothing about Security Council resolutions or international law, what you would conclude... Go ahead. What you would conclude... Do you want me to start the yeah, sentence just, over? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Uh, if you were to um, ask, if the joint resolution had not said anything about Security Council resolutions and it simply authorized the president to attack Iraq, then as a matter of our U.S. constitutional law, uh, I think you would say that the president had authority to resort to war and that you would not be able to charge him with having violated the Constitution or U.S. statutory law, but you would still be able to say there's this separate system, international legal system that's out there that also is important uh, as a normative structure, and it is possible to violate that. We are a party to a treaty, the UN Charter, which sets forth this normative system, and you could reach a conclusion that the President has violated that treaty obligation as a matter of international law. Now, treaties are part of U.S. law, but a later in time instrument, a statute, would be regarded as trumping the prior in time treaty. So Congress at any time can authorize a deviation from the U.N. Charter if it chooses to do so. 
And if you had a joint resolution to that effect as a matter of U.S. law, then they can do it. As a matter of international law, the treaty continues to be paramount, and you can't invoke a new statute in your national law as a means from escaping from your treaty obligation. Now, wouldn't Congress have to explicitly say this action that we're going to take is going to be violating uh, our treaty obligations or international law, and can you still take that angle on this, you know, say that we violated our treaty obligations? Congress uh, doesn't have to say that by passing this statute authorizing use of force, we know that we're violating our treaty obligations and we intend to do that. They could say that. They don't have to. The question would be if someone were to proceed with an action, say, in U.S. court, whereby uh, there was a question about whether or not the U.S. was violating its treaty obligations, the court would be interested in whether Congress intended to violate it or not. And if it was a harder call as to what the statute exactly meant, then courts traditionally have tried to interpret statutes to be consistent with international law whenever they can. So if you had a congressional statute that was a little bit vague, um, courts would likely say, if they take the case, and sometimes they declare these cases non-justiciable, that is, they won't even get into it, but if they take the case, they might well say, we're going to interpret this somewhat vague statute so that it's consistent with our obligations under the UN Charter. Uh, we just haven't had a case arise to that effect. Okay. And when you look at the Bush administration's both rep um, statements on the record regarding the United Nations and the weapons inspections, do you have a sense that they didn't really want the inspectors to go in or they didn't want it to work, they were looking for a pretext? Well, I think it's hard to decide whether the U.S. government as a whole had a view that we didn't really care whether the inspectors were finding something or not. There are different agencies with the U.S. US government, different people within those agencies. It's not a monolithic instrument. I think that there were many people in the U.S. government who hoped the inspectors would find things and you know that that would be a basis for, for building upon it. When they didn't find things, I'm sure there were people in the U.S. government who thought we shouldn't embark on the course we embarked upon, but the president decided what he decided and, and we, we did do so. Um, so I think it, it could have changed things quite a bit if the inspectors had found certain things. Um, they didn't find things, and we nevertheless embarked on it. So I think you would have to conclude that there were some people, the president perhaps, in the administration who were of the view that, well, even if we don't find anything, we're going to go in, um, because that's ultimately what they did. Okay. And let's see, if just sit for like 10 seconds just to get some room tone. Okay, and uh, final question. Uh, taking into consideration everything that's happened in our world, uh, our governments and our war on terrorism, the war in Iraq and everything, starting from this point now, what would you say your vision for world peace is and what we need to do to get there? Well, I think the war on terrorism, if we can call it a war on terrorism, is one where the U.S. really can't go it alone. Um, it's not a single country that we need to go out and defeat. Uh, it's just not as simple as that. You need to have a multifaceted strategy for going after large terrorist groups, individual cells ranged across a number of countries worldwide. In some instances, a use of force might be appropriate and helpful. In other instances, going after assets is going to be extremely important. In other instances, you want to grab hold of people, uh, maybe through extradition treaties or mutual legal assistance treaties, and you need help doing that. There's all different ways that one needs to proceed in order to go after terrorist organizations. And you need entities like the international institutions, whether it's the Security Council or other groups of institutions, to, to help on this. So my vision of how one should be proceeding is to be defining a fairly broad strategy 
for how you're going to get from here to 15 or 20 years from now. Uh, and that strategy is going to include policy issues, but there's going to be legal tools and instruments that you need to deploy to get to where you want to be. And those instruments, by and large, are not unilateral ones. They're multilateral ones. And that means bringing in other states in a cooperative measure, cooperative strategy, in order to go after particular individuals and particular groups. To get to that point, you need to accept the idea that not all countries think alike and that we need to be able to go to these other countries, persuade them as to what we want them to do, and convince them that they're a part of the cooperative effort in getting there. And there will be times when they disagree with us. And when that happens, we have to push hard to try to get that agreement. But if we can't, we need to roll with the punches. We need to say, okay, let's try to do it a different way. Or, okay, maybe we won't try this particular tactic. We'll try some others that we can agree upon. Until we get into a mindset where we are thinking in those terms, I think it's going to be very difficult for us to...